Hi, I'm Pastor Andrew Ebanks, lead pastor here at the Agape Family Worship Center. Thanks for watching this message and we pray all of God's blessings on your life. Here at the Agape Family Worship Center, our mission is to reach people with God's love and the life-giving message of Jesus. Our hope is that this message will take you into a deeper relationship with God and help you to grow and mature in Christ. We want to encourage you to get plugged into a church and find a pastor to shepherd and care for you. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love to have you come and join us here at Agape. You can look us up on our website, www.agapecayman.ky. Please enjoy the rest of this message, and God bless you. Well, welcome to all of you this morning, and, uh, and we are doing a, we're moving into a message today that is, is going to be very interesting. Uh, before we do that, I just want to say welcome to all of you here, but welcome to all of you who are also watching online and, and on the television program and whatever other medium you may be watching it through. God bless all of you. And I'm excited to share this message with you today. However, even though I am filled with excitement about this message, it is a little bit different of a, a little bit different excitement than I am used to. Uh, this message today is going to be a tough message, probably one of the toughest messages, if not the toughest message I have ever preached this and so thus far. And so it's going to be tough, and I just want to warn you right up front that it's going to be tough. And, uh, and it's going to be tough for me to preach. It's going to be tough for you to hear. And so uh, I'm just warning you from the get-go this morning. But I want us to loosen up a bit. And so would you turn to your neighbor? And would you, if you know him, would you put your hand on their shoulder and just say to him, this is going to be a tough week for you. Just, just look at them and tell them right now. <laughs> And tell them, you know, I'm praying for you to have faith to receive this word. I'm praying for you to have humility to receive this word. Because it is going to be tough. This is not going to be an easy one for any of us. But we believe God's word is good. Amen? Amen. And we believe that when it is difficult, that God's word gives life and is worth humbling ourselves and listening to and submitting to it because God's word speaks truth to us. And I'll be honest with you, I've been nervous about sharing this message uh, probably for the last week and a half to two weeks because of, of just the nature of this message. And as I said, it's not, a, it's not an easy message, but it is God's word. And I pray this morning that we will all have the ability to hear it humbly, and that we would humble ourselves to receive it, to hear it, and to submit to it. Because that's what God's word is. It's not my words. It's not your words. It's God's words. And so would you join with me as we pray this morning? Father God, as we look towards your word today, I pray that our hearts would be open and our ears would be ready to receive. That, Father God, that, that, that today we would see this message and that, Lord, that we would be humble enough to hear it. Because we believe that your word is good and that it brings life and is a source of life for us. And I pray this morning, Father God, that your word would touch our hearts and call us closer to you and draw us into repentance today as we seek to live for you and serve you for every single one of us. Give us the grace, the mercy, and the faith to hear what you're saying to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Today I'm going to be talking about something called affected by the fall. And this message is, as I said, as I've already said, is going to be tough. And we are going to be in Romans chapter 1 today for the majority of this message. But this message, uh, it, it, Romans chapter 1 is, is really an interesting, it's matter, uh, interesting chapter, but also it is, Romans in general is a very interesting book. And uh, as we are seeking to move into this today, I want to walk you through the context of Romans chapter 1, of, of what Paul is trying to get at here in the first few uh, verses of this book so that he can get on to talk to us about some things. And so I want us to talk through the context this morning of Romans chapter 1 so that we can properly understand where we are going with today's message. You know, Paul starts out by walking us through the fact that regardless of who we are, whether we are Jew or Gentile, 
whether we are religious or we are irreligious, that we have all essentially the same problem in life. That all of us have turned away from the knowledge of God that was made known to us in creation and in our consciences. God has sufficiently, Scripture says, revealed himself to every single person to us through creation and in us through our consciences. At least enough for us to be able to respond to the revelation that we have of who God is with humility and awe. And this is the setup that Paul is setting up here. He, he begins to talk. He says in Romans 1.16 that I am unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God for the salvation of man, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. And this is the theme by which the apostle Paul begins to, to, to dictate to us through Romans chapter 1 because he says this in verse 16. And that is essentially sort of the, the, the verse that carries the rest of the book of Romans. The fact that the gospel is needed for every single person. Because the problem was, we didn't want to know the truth about a glorious, wise, and ruling, and a holy God because of the fact that we wanted to be wise, and glorious, and ruling. And so as a result of this, the Apostle Paul says, what has happened is, is we have suppressed the knowledge of God that was evident in all of creation, and we have suppressed the knowledge of God that was evident in our consciences so that when it comes to the knowledge of God, that we would have an excuse to justify ourselves. And so he goes on to talk about the fact that basically we all know that God exists, but if we don't know, it's because we don't want to know. Because the fact is, is that God has given us enough evidence in creation and through our consciences that there is evidence enough to say God is real and he exists. The Apostle Paul, interesting that he takes this perspective. And the reality is, is that this suppression is manifested in all of us. And it manifests itself in two ways. And the first way that it manifests itself is irreligious. And so this irreligious suppression, this irreligious manifestation of this suppression, we oftentimes refer to as atheism or agnosticism. And what this basically means is that we don't believe in God. And Paul in Romans chapter 1 starts out by basically saying that there is a subconscious desire that is present in human beings for some of us to not want to know God. And as a result of it, even when it is clear as day in front of us as all of creation is, that even when it's clear in our consciences that remind us that there is a God, Paul says we don't know because we don't want to know. We don't believe because we don't want to believe. And he says the only way to come to the conclusion, this is Apostle Paul saying, the only way to come to the conclusion that God does not exist is to have a heart that is biased towards the obvious evidence of an all-powerful, creating, all-knowing, all-ruling God. And so, it's interesting because in my experience in dealing with, with, with atheists and having conversations with them, their disbelief is often usually driven by the implication of the fact that there is an all-glorious and all-wise God. What do I mean by that? This implication determines how they, uh, how they view the evidence or interpret the evidence of God that is in creation. So let me explain a little bit differently. What that usually means is what they say, if there was a God, then why do all these bad things keep happening in the world? If God really was real, then why did God not stop that thing from happening? If there really was a God, then why are there so many religions? If there really was a God, then why don't more people know God the way that you seem to keep talking about him? And what Paul says is that this is the 
irreligious suppression of the human heart that comes to terms and says, God does not exist because if God did, then none of this should be happening. And that's usually the perspective, to be honest with you, that, I, that, that when I talk to a lot of atheists that they, that they come from. But he says there's another form of suppression that suppresses the truth. And he says it's a religious suppression. And this religious suppression is more often or most often known as idolatry, where we substitute our knowledge of the true God with a version of God that is more easily able to be controlled. And we have our gods who exist to serve us. And this idea has been present all throughout history. For those of you who, who are familiar with the story where, where Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from God, and he's been up there for a while, and the people begin to get restless because they look up the mountain and they see this cloud of God's glory, but Moses hasn't come back yet. And so they start freaking out. So they go to Aaron and say, Aaron, what, what's up with Moses? It doesn't seem like he's coming back. What's going on? You know, what about God and all this stuff? And what Aaron does is he tells the people then to bring all their gold and all this stuff. And so they bring the stuff. And what Aaron does is Aaron makes a golden calf. What's interesting about the fact that Aaron makes a golden calf is that Aaron looks at them and says, this is the God who brought you out of Egypt. Now hear the point of what Aaron is saying. He's not presenting a different God to them. He's saying to them, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. This is the God of Israel, and we're going to give him a form, and we're going to make him in the image that we want to make him in. And isn't it interesting that Moses is up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, and it, God says that you shall not make any graven images, that you shall not make any false images, any false idols. You see, because the reality is that for all of us, if we're not careful in this religious suppression of the truth, what happens is, is that we try to make gods of our own making. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 25. He says, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. See, what he's saying here is the fact that, that, that we know the truth, but we've exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Because the reality is, is what we want is we, we want something different than what God has said. And as a result of it, we, 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 we might take the God of the Bible, we might take a version of Jesus, and we begin to alter him and shape him to look a little bit more tolerable for us. And Paul says, we've got to be careful. You know, there have been tons of studies that show that we as people in general, the human race, are a purpose, a purposed people. The reality is, is that for all of us as human beings, we will find a purpose, a greater cause to live for. Every single one of us. Something that wakes us up in the morning. Something that makes life worth living. Something that we will attach ultimate value to. There's a, a, a Canadian psychologist by the name of Jordan Peterson. He's not a Christian. But here's what he said. And I, and I find it so interesting. He said, there are no true atheists, practically speaking. There are just those who acknowledge the gods they are worshiping and those who do not. You see... Because the chances are that even for those of us here this morning, even for those of us listening to this, that, that even if you grew up in church, chances are that there was something besides God that took ultimate central place in your heart. Maybe growing up in church, it, it, it was getting the approval of other people. Maybe it was accomplishing your dream that became more important than God. Maybe it was a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Maybe it was getting married and having a family or, or, or whatever it is, something at some point took the central place in our lives that belonged to God even for those of us who have grown up in church. And hey, I've been in church my entire life, and I can tell you that's true. And that's what Paul's saying. That, that, that we exchange truths about God 
for a lie and we worship these things that we create rather than the one who created all things. You see, something at some point mattered to you more than God. Something at some point in your life, you gave more glory to that created thing than you gave to God. In the, in the Hebrew, the word glory is the word kavod, and it, and it means giving weight. And it's essentially the idea that God was supposed to be the one who was supposed to make life worth living, that he was supposed to be valuable above all else, that fellowship with him was priority, but we found something else in life to give weight to. We found something else in life that the natural inclination of our human heart says, I would rather that than God. And that's the inclination for every single one of us, whether you grew up in church or not. You know, a few years back, I was traveling, and as we were traveling, we, we visited some, some temples that were built to other gods, and as we were there, it was a group of us, and, and we were standing, and I'll never forget, we walked in, and, and we were just admiring this beautiful temple that was created to this god. And it was interesting because... As we were there, people kept coming in and they would worship the statue. And I, and I, just, I just remember, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm out of here. And the, the group that was with me, they were like, yeah, let's, let's get out of here. And, and we left. And, and, and after we left, the group of us were standing around talking. And, and, and we were talking about how we were thanking God that we weren't like them, that, that, that we were thanking God that, that, that we, we weren't coming and, and worshiping like this. And, and then years later, it hit me. Years later, it hit me that even if I wasn't like them, I had a list of things in my own heart that I had replaced God with, a list of things in my own heart that, that, that I had placed God to the side and given weight to something in my life that should have only belonged to God regardless of what it was. And the reality is, as people, is that we give this godlike weight to things that should not have it in our lives. We give this, this value to things, that, and, and we don't look at it and say, oh, this is my God, I'm going to worship it. But the way we treat it, the weight that we give to it in our lives says that this is more important to me than God. The amount of time that we spend on it, the amount of time that, that we think about it, the amount of time that, that we focus on it, the amount of time that we give to it says, God, this is more important to me. This has more weight in my life and more value in my life than you do. And as a result of it, we have all given God-like weight to something that is not God whether it was the approval of others. We gave something the weight at the expense of not pursuing God. And that false worship is just as nauseating to God as being in that temple was to me. And Paul's point in Romans chapter 1 is simply this, that we have all exchanged the glory of God, the creator of all, for things that have been created by man. And it was never God's intent, things that we could, be, that we could control, things that would bend to our will, all of us have gone astray. All of us have done this. And so that's why when Romans chapter 1 verse 26, it says, for this reason, God delivered them over to disgraceful passions. This is the, the first wave of God's judgment on humanity. That he, dis, he, he delivered us over to disgraceful passions. You know what he's saying here? God gave us what we asked for. You know, can you just imagine with me if the earth told the sun one day, I don't want you to be the center of the universe, uh, the center of the solar system anymore. I'm sick and tired of rotating around you all day. I want to be the center of everything. I want the rest of the solar system to revolve around me. And let's just say that the earth, the sun gave the earth 
what it wanted. And the son says, okay, fine. You want everything to revolve around you? Then fine. We will all revolve around you. But here's the thing is that the son weighs 333,000 times what the earth weighs. You could fit over one million earths inside the sun. It's so big. The earth does not have the ability to be able to host and, and have the rest of the solar system revolve around it. It's just, it's not big enough. It doesn't have that kind of weight. The sun doesn't need to punish the earth. If the sun simply gives the earth what it wants, it'll be punished enough. Because the reason why we are able to even function and live in, the society, in this solar system is due to the fact that we revolve around the sun. You know, just a little bit closer, just 2% closer to the sun and we're dead. 2% further away and we're dead. You know, it was interesting, a few years ago, there was a study done on, on, on what was required in order for there to be life on a planet. And when they started out, they said that there was only a few basic things. I believe it was less than 10. And as time went on, they kept adding more and more and more things to this list because they realized that the conditions for life to exist are astronomical. And the reality of it is, is what Paul is saying here is that God doesn't need to punish us. All God needs to do is say, I'm going to give you what you want. And as a result of giving us what we want, our lives began to revolve around us, not him. And so our lives, our society, the world as we know it began to unravel as a rest of it, as a result of it. And so when we read the rest of Romans chapter 1, when you read it in the original Greek, you, you see this sort of tit for tat taking place here in, in, in the chapters where it talks about how because we did this, God did this. And so when we read verse 23, it says, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. When we read verse 26, it says, so God gave them over to, ex uh, God exchanged them over to disgraceful passions and unnatural sexual desires. When we read verse 21, it says, they dishonored God, so God let them dishonor themselves. When we reach verse 28, it says, they did not see fit to acknowledge God, so God gave them up to an unfit mind. See, there's this tit for tat going on where God says, if this is what you want, then I'll give it to you. And, and this is where things take an interesting turn. Because Paul now begins to talk about what this looks like in our society. And he begins to talk about what this looks like in our lives and what this looks like in our families. And in Romans chapter 1, 26 and 27, he says this. He says, because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with their lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, this is the longest and one of the clearest passages that we have in Scripture about homosexuality. And now let me just be honest about this up front. The church globally has not always done a great job in talking about this issue and talking through this. And so today I pray that as we look at the rest of this message, that we would do so humbly and openly at what God's word has to say about this. Because I want to talk about this, but I want to talk about what this means for those of us who seek to follow Jesus, because this is important. You see, Paul says that one of the things that happens, one of the results of displacing God in our hearts and in our lives is that we developed unnatural sexual patterns. In verse 25, where he says, we exchange the truth about God for a lie. And so God exchanged, as a result of the fact that we exchanged the truth about God for a lie, God exchanged natural, healthy patterns in our lives for unnatural ones. And this is where Paul turns first. It's not the only thing that he talks about, let me, let me say that, but it's first on the list. 
And it's one of the first things that he addresses. And the thing that shouldn't surprise us is that this is mentioned. Because if God made us in his image, male and female in the beginning like he said he did, then it shouldn't surprise us that the effects of our rejection of God should show up in these primary relationships. That the rejection of God in our lives shows up in our relationships as man and woman between male and female. And so one of the things that happens is Paul cites homosexuality because it is the clearest example of the rejection of God's order in all of creation. It says male and female, he created them for this reason of man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. You see, there's no way to get around scripture about what it teaches about who God made us and the the kind of relationships that God intended for us to have. You know, in recent years, one of the things that's happened, particularly even in the church, is that people have come about and they said, well, you know, Paul is only referring to certain kinds of homosexuality. You know, he's, he's, he's talking about, you know, promiscuous things like, 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 like you know, prostitution and one-night stands and, 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 you know, a master forcing himself on his slaves. You know, Paul was, was just maybe unfamiliar with the kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of same-sex relationships that, that we know about today in our culture where, where you know, we, and we see it trying to be recognized in Cayman and in other places in the world. And if he had been aware of that kind of same-sex relationship, if he had been aware of that kind of homosexuality, then he would have been okay with it. And that's just simply not the truth. Because same-sex relationships, committed same-sex relationships, were certainly a thing in the Roman world. And Paul most definitely knew about them. Not only was Paul Jewish, Paul was Roman. And so Paul had this Roman citizenship. There's There's a contemporary of Paul's. He wasn't a Christian by the name of Plutarch. And he was a writer in the first century, and he makes a distinction in his writings about homosexual relationships and sex for just pleasure that he referred to as unworthy and homosexual practice in a committed relationship that he considered to be worthy. This is during Paul's time. Even Plato, who existed several hundred years before Paul, mentions two men who had been in a committed relationship for more than 10 years. Plato, who we still talk about and read his works today. So Paul, as a a well-read Roman citizen, he would most certainly have been knowledgeable about these same-sex relationships and about these times and this very, very dominant practice in the Roman culture. But he does not distinguish between the types of relationships, but he refers to all acts committed between men and men, women and women, as a departure from the Creator's design for human flourishing. And he says that it was unnatural. As a matter of fact, the Greek word there literally means against nature. He says God calls this sin. And it's important to note as well, though, that Paul does not only talk about homosexuality. That's the, not the only thing on this list that he references. He's just citing it as one of the clearest examples of elevating our desires over the Creator's design. There's other examples that he uses to help us understand how we have departed from God's design in, 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 in creation. Other examples where we have said, it's not about what you have designed, God. It's about my desires and what I want. It's not about what you want. It's about what I want. And so Paul begins to list other ways that we have elevated our desires above the Creator's design and see creation unravel. So we'll come back to homosexuality in just a second. But when we begin reading Romans chapter 128, Paul starts talking here and he says, since they, and by the way, this they that Paul is referring to, he's not referring to homosexuality, he's referring back to what we read just a little bit ago, those who have exchanged the truth of God for a lie, that's who he's talking about, so he's talking about everybody, that includes homosexuality and everyone else who has done this, and he says, they are, they, this they 
is Paul rhetorically building his argument that this day is everyone who has exchanged the truth of God for a lie. In chapter 2, when you read chapter 2, you'll discover that this they that he's actually talking about is we. That Paul goes on to explain that we have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. That this day is not an us and them, like, oh, look at how much we know about God and how much we love God. No, he says, we have all exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We have all turned away. And Paul is going to explain about himself that he is a chief member of this group. That he himself, as the Apostle Paul, who's, who's one of the greatest Christian authors that we know, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, this incredibly powerful man of God, he says, I'm a chief member of this group. The man who says, I was perfect in regard to the law. He says, I am one of those people who have, has exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And he tells Timothy, his spiritual son in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he says that I am the chief of all sinners, talking about himself. So when you see they, we can read it as we. So Paul says, since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. So he goes on to explain what these things are in this list that should never be done. And, he, and, and sexual disorder was the first thing that happens that he talks about. Well, look at what he says in Romans chapter 1, 29 to 31. He says, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. This is the list that he brings out. And what Paul is trying to show us is that our departure from letting God be the center of our lives has brought about disorder and chaos in all of humanity. It's brought about sexual disorder. It's brought about economic disorder. It's brought about spiritual disorder. It's brought about family disorder. It's brought about all these disorders. And it's not meant to be an exhaustive list. But Paul says here, and it is clear that Paul wants all of us to see our idolatry and the elevation of our own desires in our lives over God's will. That the insertion of ourselves as the center has affected every single part of our lives for every single one of us. And this is what theologians call the doctrine of total depravity. This doesn't mean, total depravity doesn't mean that we are at the maximum level of hatred and evil in the world. What total depravity means is that our rejection of God as the center of our lives has corrupted every part of our lives. That there's no part of you and me that has not been touched and corrupted by this departure from making God be the center of our lives. You see, Paul starts with homosexuality, but he goes on to show that literally every aspect of our lives is affected by the disorder that comes from putting ourselves at the center instead of God. You know, there was a, a friend a few years ago who asked me if, if homosexuality is the worst sin, and I'll be honest, I don't claim to know everything about Scripture. I don't know, claim to know everything about Romans chapter 1 or the Bible. But Scripture teaches that all sin is not the same. And this is what a lot of people confuse today. Scripture shows us that all sin is not on the same level. For instance, when Jesus was in Capernaum, he was doing miracles and preaching the word of God. He was in Capernaum doing all kinds of good works, and they would not believe in him. And he goes on to say this, that it will be more tolerable for Sodom on the day of judgment than it would be for Capernaum because they would not repent and believe in Jesus. Sodom is the, the city that is recognized as, as being one of the most depraved cities in all of history, even to this day. And one of the major things that was present there was homosexuality, other things as well. 
But, but that was one of the major things that was present there. And Jesus says about Capernaum, it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for you because you refuse to repent and believe. So right there, Jesus says, hey, it's not on the same level. You see, and there's, there's other things that we don't have time to get into this morning, but the reality is, is that all sin separates us from God. Every single one. There is no sin, no matter how big or small that you think it is, there is no sin that does not separate us from God. That little white lie that we like to tell that's not a big deal, that separates you from God. That, that, those, those things that we like to do in our lives, that we like to justify and say it's okay and it's all right, that separates you from God. Jesus died for all sin. And the reality is, is that we don't believe that all sin is the same. Because how many of you believe that that lie you told to not go to work because you just didn't feel like getting up in the morning is the same as murdering somebody? But yet that sin has still separated you from God. So the reality is, is that no, not all sin is the same and not all sin will be judged the same. But the reality is, is that all sin separates us from God. And I'll tell you what, I don't care how small it is, I don't want it in my life if it's going to keep me separated from him. So, this is Paul's point. Regardless of how significant or insignificant you think your sin is, even the smallest sin, if it's not repented of, will send you to hell. Even the sin that we can look at and we can, we, can, we can start comparing and we can start nitpicking and we can start going, hey, maybe this one is better than that one. So as long as I only do those, those you know, not so bad sins, I'll be okay. Paul says, no, no. Any sin that you commit, no matter how big or how small you think it is, will separate you from God for an eternity. And you will spend an eternity in hell as a result of the fact that you have been separated from him. Matter of fact, let me ask you an important question. When I read the rest of that list, how many of you identified yourself in the rest of that list? How many of you identified where your depravity and where your sin, Paul mentions it here? I mean, let, let's just reread that list for just a second. Let, let, let's go back. Where he, he says in, in chapter 1, verse 29 to 31, where he says, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, hey, What's, what's sexual immorality? Sexual immorality isn't just homosexuality. You sleeping with somebody you ain't married to? You married and sleeping with somebody else? It says, that's sin. Wickedness, covetousness, I, I, I want that. I'm going to get it at any cost. Maliciousness, they did this to me, so I got to do that to them. Full of envy. Oh, my, I want us so, so, so bad. You have no idea how much I just want that right now. Murder. Remember what Jesus said? He says, if you even hate someone in your heart, you've already been guilty of the sin of murder. <sighs> Strife, you causing problems and, and issues between people. Deceit, where you, you, you're deceiving people. Evil-mindedness. No, he didn't say that you do evil things. He said evil mindedness, just even the wicked thoughts that we have. He says they are whisperers. They whisper in behind. Oh, you hear Pastor Andrew? Backbiters. Somebody says something to you, you always got to get back. Like, mm, look at what he said to me. I got to clap back today. My razor blade and my Vaseline coming out. And Jesus says, Paul says that we're haters of God. I don't hate God. Have you made something else the center of your life? He says they're violent. They're proud. They're boasters. Oh, look at me. Look at all I've accomplished. Look at all I've done. I, this one always gets me. Inventor of the evil things. How many things have we done or created or crafted for the sake and purpose of committing evil? Disobedient to parents. <laughs> nobody, just in case you, you, you got skipped and all the rest of it, nobody missing this one. Because you're going to tell me that, yeah, mom and dad told me what to do, and every single time, without fail, I was obedient. 
never talked back, never did anything wrong. Mom and I always listened to mom and dad. No. Undiscerning, meaning that, 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 that we, we lack wisdom, untrustworthy. Someone puts their trust in us and we violate that. Unloving, I, I, don't, I don't love you. I, I, or, or I'm not going to show love towards you. you. You frustrate me. You get me angry. You make me upset. Unforgiving, you, you hurt me too bad. I, I don't know that I could ever forgive you for this. You've hurt me too bad. Unmerciful, you hurt me. You deserve this. Do we come out clean in this list? You can speak for yourself, but I sure don't. How many of us can identify ourselves in 95% of this list? Because Paul's point is that corruption manifests itself differently in different people. And for some of us, that may be some kind of sexual immorality, uh, addicted to pornography, or, or sleeping with people we shouldn't be, or homosexuality, or whatever it is. It might be pride. It might be misuse of our funds. It, 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 whatever it is. He says, all of us have sin in our lives that should be repented of regardless of what it is, regardless of how big you think it is or how small you think it is. He says, all sin is going to keep you out of God's presence. All of it. And I might struggle with certain things more than you, but my heart is just as corrupt and vice versa. My heart is corrupt and so is yours. If you're looking for the perfect church and you showed up here today, I'm sorry to inform you, we are not a perfect church. Every single one of us in this room, including you, has a heart of corruption. But the really important question is this. Are the things in this list the cause of God's judgment or the result of God's judgment? Be careful. Are all the things in this list the cause of God's judgment in our lives or the result of God's judgment in our lives? Paul says it's both. Paul says it's, it, it's both. He says it, it's because we have done evil things that God has continued to give us over to depravity. And it's because we've done evil things why, why God has judged us for those things in the first place. You see, the really wicked sin in all of our lives is that we rejected God as the center of our life. That is what brought on all the other corruption. That's what we see happening in Genesis, that all of us has willfully and gladly participated in that sin, trying to put ourselves in his place. He says that there's none righteous, not even one of us. None. That all of, our, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. You see, we don't always get to choose how our corruption affects us. For some of us, it's pride or lust or an out-of-control temper or ambition or our inability to control our impulses towards food or doubt or worry or depression. For some of us, it's expressed in corrupted sexual desire, whatever form that looks like. And in some ways, we have all experienced sinful sexual desire. Whether it's a homosexual desire or a heterosexual one. We've all experienced that sinful sexual desire. Man, he looked real good today. Ladies, you all know what I'm talking about. Fellas, you know what I'm talking about. You're driving down the road and you drive across her and you're looking in your rearview mirror. Your wife's sitting next to you and you hope she don't see you. Be honest. We, we've all experienced this in our lives. And the point is always the same, that we have rejected God's rule and substituted ourselves in God's place because we wanted to be like God. We wanted to be him. And I'll be honest with you, as a pastor and, and having to have to deal with people, for instance, who struggle with, with, with same-sex attractions in their life, who feel like they oftentimes didn't choose those desires in their life. They, they oftentimes don't feel like that was a, a choice that they made. That's why you hear a lot of them say that they feel like they were born this way. 
and people struggling with same-sex attraction in the church, at least oftentimes, the result of, 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 of this has oftentimes come as a result of an unanswered prayer. Meaning that a lot of times when, I, when I'm talking to people about this in the church, God, why didn't you take this desire away from me when I asked you to? God, why didn't you change this? God, why did, why did you make me this way? Is oftentimes what, what people will say or, or feel. But this doesn't make same-sex behavior any less sinful. Let me just say that. It doesn't make same-sex marriage any more acceptable in our society. And it doesn't make it any more acceptable to God. It doesn't make outbursts of anger any more acceptable. It doesn't make disobedience, disobeying your parents any less sinful. It doesn't make gossip any less sinful. This is why people need to be the recipients of our compassion. And let me just say this. If you want help, if you're struggling and you say, I, I don't know what to do and, and I have this desire and I'm not sure about how to handle it, regardless of what it is, we're here to help. No, we're not experts and no, we can't solve all the problems in the world. But we're here to help and to love people and, and, and to walk with you through the struggles that you have in your life, regardless of what they are. That doesn't mean that we're going to pat you in the back and say, hey, it's all good. Just keep doing what you're doing. It'll work out. But it means that we're all here to help and love and walk through these things together because we're all struggling in different ways. Some of us are struggling in our marriages. Some of us are struggling because we have a homosexual desire. Some of us are struggling because we're addicted to porn. Some of us are struggling because we don't know how to manage our finances. Some of us are struggling because our marriage is falling apart and we don't know what to do and we don't know how to handle it. This is why we exist to help. So there's several things we need to think about in regards to all of this. How do we, as a church, respond to this? Well, first of all, we need to understand one thing. God cares about this issue, and he cares about these issues. Some people think that God doesn't really care that much, and that it's not that big of a deal. But he does, and God is crystal clear. Don't let anybody tell you the Bible isn't crystal clear about sin. Regardless of what that sin is, it's clear about homosexuality, it's clear about sexual immorality, it's clear about pride, religious or irreligious pride. It's clear about all these things. And in this passage we're about to read in at least five other uh, passages in the Old and in the New Testament, it could not be any clearer what God's stance is. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 9 to 10, he says, Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says there's no one on this list that will inherit the kingdom of God. There's no one who does these things. Anyone who unapologetically stands and shakes their fist at God and says, this is who I am, this is what I'm going to do, this is my desire. Paul says, you will not inherit the kingdom. You will not inherit the kingdom of God, regardless of what your sin is. Again, that doesn't change anything. Because all our sin separates us from God. All of our sin. Regardless of how it will be judged in the end, all of our sin has kept us out of his presence. And you may say, I was born this way. And whether you were or not, we were all born with a propensity towards sin. Our own sin, our own selfish ambition or pride or raging temper or raging hormones. We were all born into sin, but the Bible's message is clear. Regardless of how you were born, you must be born again. Every single one of us. None of us escapes that. And we must understand that possessing a desire innately does not make it right. Just because something comes from deep inside of us does not make it right. Our anger, the Bible says be angry and sin not. Doesn't it not? Be angry. Sure, get angry, but do not sin in your anger. It's clear about this. Your ambition, 
You know what we were talking about in our life group the last time? We were talking about the fact that favoritism is a sin. James tells us that. That favoritism is a sin. That's incredible. We were all blown away. We were just like, man, we are worse sinners than we thought we were. You see, the, the reality is, is that just because something comes from deep inside of us does not make it right. So you burn in with passion and you have this desire to get married. But, but hey, you know what? I'm go, I've got all this desire inside of me. So, you know, I'm going to marry him anyway. I'm going to sleep with him before we get married. Jesus says, Paul says, he says, it's still sin. Desire does not make something right. He says it's still sinful. You know, my wife is a 10. You know, in college, everybody agreed I was like a solid two and a half. But my wife is a 10, and she's just beautiful. And I, and I remember one day, uh, there was a friend of mine in college who she just said to me, she's like, you know, if you want to get a girl, you're going to have to change the way you dress. I remember Mr. Ice Cube, and big gold chain, big bag of pants. My short pants were long pants, you know, all that kind of stuff, hanging down low. And I had a girlfriend of mine who said to me, she says, if you want to get a girl, you're going to have to change the way you dress because I wouldn't take you home to my dog, much less my mother. I was like, oh, that's hurtful. And my wife is absolutely beautiful. But here's the thing. Can you imagine I say to my wife, you know, sweetheart, I keep finding myself being attracted to other women. You're beautiful and I love you. But, but I keep finding myself being attracted to other women. And the only conclusion that I can come to is that because I have this desire, I must be a polygamist. So we're going to have to get some other people and jo join into this. You would not see me next Sunday, just so you know. I don't know where I would be. But divorce would not be across her mind, but murder would probably cross it several times. You see, possessing these desires are just proof that our heart is corrupted. Just because we have a desire for something does not make it any less sinful, does not make it any less corrupted. It is still sinful. It is still corrupted. It is still wrong. And we must be born again. And that's Paul's whole point, that you can't save yourself. You can't reform yourself. You, religions and laws won't save you because they don't have the power of God. They don't have the resurrection power that we don't have in ourselves, but that only comes through Jesus Christ. And this is why we are hopeless without Jesus. Because the gospel message to all of us is this, is that we were all dead in our sins and we need to be made alive in Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't come to make the bad good. He came to make the dead live. And every single one of us, that talks about us. So not only do we need to understand that God cares about this issue and more, we need to also understand that we need to balance grace and truth in our lives. You know, as Christians, we want to follow Jesus' example, but we also want to allow him to change our hearts. In our lives, we, we usually lean more towards being either gracious or truthful rather than living out the balance. When we tend to lean more towards grace, what we do is say, it doesn't matter what you believe, it doesn't matter what you do, just be happy, Jesus loves you, live how you want, God is forgiving, he understands, he just, he wants you to be happy. And when we lean just towards truth, we need, we have this thing in us that says, I always need to be heard, I always have to be right, I always have to make a point, I have to comment on everything that's being said or done, you're a sinner, you're going to hell, that's it. But John chapter 14 verse 1 tells us that the word, Jesus, became flesh and his dwelling among us and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. That's what John chapter 14 1 tells us. Jesus came full of grace and truth. When we met Jesus when he came, he was full of grace and truth. When he died on the cross, he was full of grace and truth. Jesus modeled these two things in balance. Every conversation that he had, every person he encountered, all of his truths were told in grace and all of his grace was given in truth. The woman at the well who 
had been married five times or had five different men in her life or whatever the situation really was with her, she stood there wanting to debate religion with Jesus, then actually talk to Jesus about what her problem was. And I'll be honest with you, if you read that story, particularly in the Greek, Jesus was brutally honest with this woman. As a matter of fact, it's a bit of an awkward conversation for her because she's standing there and Jesus is telling her about all the wrong things that she's done. And she's standing there and she's going, man. Matter of fact, she's very thankful for it later because she goes and tells the whole city, you should come see this man who told me about everything I ever did. But when Jesus is talking to her, she's standing there and she would rather debate about religion than receive the fact that Jesus is calling out her sin and calling her to repentance. Yet, Jesus gives her grace and says, go and sin no more. The woman caught in adultery, they were testing Jesus. They said, Jesus, this woman was caught in adultery. Well, I want to know where was the guy that she was with. But but she was caught in adultery, and the Bible says they wanted to test Jesus, so they brought her to Jesus, and the crowd was ready to stone her at a moment's notice. They were ready to kill her, and Jesus, rather than responding, stoops down and starts writing in the sand with his finger, and then he looks at her after everybody leaves. He says, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And everybody's like, well, we sinful, so even though I really want to throw the stone, I can't. And they all turn around and walk away. And then Jesus looks at them and he says to them, he, he looks up and he sees a woman. And he says, where are all your accusers? And she goes, they're gone. There's only one accuser left, and that's you. And Jesus says, well, they didn't condemn you, so neither do I. You see, I want you to understand something about condemnation is that condemnation says you deserve to die. That's what condemnation says. So when people say you're condemning me, when we use the word condemnation, that means you're telling me that I deserve to die. And the Bible makes that clear that we deserve to die for the sin that we committed, but Jesus paid the price in our place. Jesus looks at this woman, he tells her again, Go and sin no more. The man at the pool of Bethesda, he was there for 38 years. He was at that pool longer than I've been alive. And Jesus heals this man. And the man leaves. And then Jesus goes, the scripture says, Jesus goes searching for him to find him. Because it was almost like Jesus didn't get the opportunity to tell him. You know what? Jesus went looking for this man to tell him. Sin no more before something worse happens. Stop pursuing sin because the more you pursue sin, you are going to face it. Many scholars agree that what Jesus is talking about is the judgment of God on this man's life. Not just that something bad will happen to him, but that God will judge him as a result of this. Whether that's his eternal judgment or something in, in this life is not clear. But the point remains the same. Jesus leaves him with a warning. The more you pursue sin, the more likelihood something bad's going to happen. Jesus' message to all of humanity is the same. Go and sin no more. He makes it clear for all of us. And when Jesus says go and sin no more, he's not talking about sinless perfection. He was warning against a return to sinful lifestyle choices. Regardless of how big or how little or how irrelevant or relevant you think your sin is, Jesus died for that sin. That sin nailed him to a cross and his words both extended mercy and it demanded holiness. Jesus never spoke to us in just grace or just truth. He always balanced grace and grace and truth. You see, because with the forgiveness of sin comes the expectation that we will not continue on the same path of rebelliousness. That those who know God and know God's love will naturally want to obey him. That's why Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 15, those who love me keep my commandments. He says, if you're going to say that you're going to follow me, if you're going to say that you love me, he says, then you got to do what I said. And I said, stop. He says, I said, no more sin, no more pursuit of that. You see, because grace without truth will lead us to believe that we can do whatever we want 
to do and believe whatever we want to believe, and that's all right. I want to show you something this morning. I've got a little rubber band here with me. And here's the thing is that as Christians, we have to learn to live. And Jesus says, the Bible says that Jesus came, what? Full of grace and truth. But the reality of it is, is that oftentimes we go grace or we go truth. And the reality is, is that grace by itself, when we let go of truth, it hurts. And the reality is, is that when there is truth and there is no grace, it hurts. The Bible says Jesus came full of grace and truth. As Christians, here's the reality. I know that this sermon is probably uncomfortable for all of us or several of us, most of us, all of us. But as Christians, we've got to learn to live within this tension. This tension of grace and truth that, that I, you, yes, you sin and you do wrong, but I still have to be gracious and loving towards you. Yes, I have to be gracious and loving towards you, but, but, I, but the Bible says that it's sin. We have to learn to live within this tension and learn how to live this out in between. Because when we do just one, grace alone is destructive. And truth alone is destructive. Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 6, 1 and 2. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? He says, there's no way for you who have been put to death with Christ at the cross to return back to that sinful lifestyle. He says, grace is not your license to just do what you want. It's not, oh, I'm going to do this, ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness is better than permission. No, it's not. It's not. Because Jesus died for every sin. Your sin, no matter how small or how big you think it is, literally killed someone. It killed Jesus. But aren't Christians supposed to love and not be judgmental? Can I tell you this? Telling someone that what they have done, God has called sin, is not our judgment. It's God's. Telling you that God said that what you just did is sin is not judgmental of me. You know why? Because God's the one that said it. I'm just saying what God has already said. However... How I treat you as a result of telling you that truth will determine whether I'm judgmental or not. Whether I give grace or not will determine whether I'm judgmental. What does that mean? That means that, that, that how I treat people as a result of knowing what their sin is determines whether we are judgmental or not as Christians. So just saying to someone, hey, God calls that sin. God said that, 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 that what you're doing right now is sin is not judgmental of us. You see, because what happens a lot of times is that one of the most misunderstood, misquoted scriptures in the Bible is when someone tries to justify their lifestyle choice by walking up to you and saying, well, they pull out their, their trump card. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Then they drop the mic like they're expecting you to just be like, oh, sorry, whoops. No. Like we're supposed to immediately just embrace from that point on the fact they want to have sex with someone they're not married to. That they, that they, they, they want to have an affair, that, that they want to marry someone of the same sex, or, or they want to be a goat, or they want to sell a goat, or whatever. It says, as Christians, we're supposed to love and accept all people. That's what the Bible says. But we can love and accept all people without giving approval to the choices that they make in life. We don't have to love and we, we, we have to love and accept people, but we don't have to approve of the choices that people make. When Jesus says in Matthew 7, judge not that you will not be judged for with the same judgment you pronounce, you will be judged and with the measure you use it, it will be used to, measured to you. You know what Jesus is saying here? He said, however you judge, you're gonna be, that judgment measure is gonna be used back on you. So when you judge Christians, guess what? God's gonna use that measurement back on you. When you judge other people because you're, you're a Christian, God's going to use that back on you. But you know what Jesus says? 
He says, remove the log from your eye so that you can see the speck clearly in theirs. You know what he's saying there? He's not saying not to share a judgment with people. What he's saying is, is that we have to be careful that we ourselves are not living in the same sin. And then trying to tell people it's okay. You know, I can't tell you the number of parents that, that, that are sleeping with people, but they wanted to turn around and tell their kids, oh, it's, it's not right for you to do that. Like, do I say, but not what I do? And the and, and Bible says, hey, you got a log in your eye that you need to remove. I'm not saying that that's right. I'm saying that it's still sinful and that if you want to talk about it, the Bible says, then you have to be willing to clean your own or have your own life cleaned up from that mess as well. So if you judge with grace and truth, guess what? You will be judged with grace and truth. As Christians, we're all going to be judged. All of humanity will be judged. The difference is when God judges us, what is he going to see? Is he going to see the righteousness of Jesus Christ or not? Let me just say someone's sin in their life does not excuse us to be sinful towards them, regardless of what that sin is. Some of us say, well, they did that, and that's their choice, and that's what they did, and then we react sinfully as a result of it. That's, that's not biblical. You can't justify one sin with another. Let me be clear about something. What sends all of us to hell is refusing to let Jesus be Lord over our lives. Every single person that goes to hell will go to hell because there was a refusal to let Jesus be a Lord over their life. Whether that's Lord over their sexual life, or whether it was Lord over their money, or whether it was Lord over their career, or Lord over their gossip, or Lord over their slander, or Lord over their disobedience. Whatever it is, all of us will go to hell because we refuse to let Jesus be Lord over our lives. It's not where you ex express your rebellion that sends you to hell. It's the fact that rebellions exist in your heart in the first place that makes us all worthy of hell. All of us deserve it. But according to Romans 1, the fact that sin is there at all shows us how much we need God. In Romans 1, we all find ourselves like Eve in the Garden of Eden trying to figure out who determines what is good. Because up until that point, God was the one who said, this is good. God was the one who said that is good. Until Eve comes along and she's like, man, that fruit on that tree looks real good. I want that, so I determine what is good. God knows what is best and why. And so God knows when he said that drunkenness leads to all kinds of problems, don't do it. God knows why he told us don't get drunk. Because it leads to all kinds of horrible decisions. It leads to addiction. It leads to abuse physically and sexually. That gossip is hurtful and, it and it's vindictive and it causes a lot of pain and struggle. That sexual immorality in all forms brings about all kinds of issues and problems. That, 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 that there's problems in the relationships, that there's health issues, that, that children begin to struggle and function. You want me to tell you what all the statistics show? All the statistics show us that when children are born in a, in a relationship with a, with a father and a mother living together in a union of marriage like God said, they function and they have less, they, they function at a higher level in life. They have less mental problems. They, they, they do better in school. They tend to be more successful overall in the majority of their life. When, when you have children outside of marriage, your children struggle more in all those areas. And it's even worse in a homosexual relationship. So when God said, this is the way I want it done, God knew what he was talking about. When God said, don't drink and don't get, or don't get drunk, God said it. Why? How many people have died because they went and got drunk and were driving? God knows what he's talking about when he tells us these things. That's why God's design works best, one man, one woman in marriage, to avoid sin. Genesis 2.24, where, where, where God talks about, you know, the, the, the fact that, that man shall be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. There's no way to get around God's design. Our sinful desire doesn't change God's design, even if our culture says it's okay, even if the government acknowledges it, it doesn't matter, it doesn't change God's design. 
And just like God's design is for us to wait, on ma- uh, uh, wait until marriage before we have sex, or just like God's design is that we would be a good steward, just like God's design is that we would be pure, just like God's design is that we would be holy, just like God's design is that we would be single. For those of you who are single, not all people are meant to be married. Let me just tell you that. Scripture teaches us that. And that's okay. But it's my desire to be God that is at the core of my rebellion. And the desire to be the one to declare what is good and evil. The desire to play judge rather than to be judged. A desire to use God's creation for our own gratification rather than with pleasure for his glory. That is what is at the core of mine and your rebellion. Paul says if we don't know, it's because we don't want to know. He says that there is enough evidence in creation, that there's enough evidence in Scripture, that there's enough evidence in our conscience to say to all of us that if we don't know, it's because we don't want to know. You know, it's interesting, when slavery first came to the U.S., the Dutch showed up in the U.S., and they're like, hey, you know, we've got some slaves here. We'd like to sell them to you. And, uh, and they bought them, but they bought them in this indentured servitude program. They didn't really want to do it, but they did it because what they said is, well, what we'll do is we'll make them work for us, basically, and then they can buy their own freedom. Well, when they re- realized how lucrative and how economically beneficial it was, they changed their minds. You see, they knew how wrong it was to buy and sell people as slaves, yet nonetheless, because it was economically beneficial, what did they do? We don't know because we don't want to know. And this is Paul's point. Romans chapter 132 says, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, They only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Here's what he's saying. He's saying when God makes a righteous decree, when God calls something sinful, when God says that it's wrong, and we say, no, it's okay, no, it's all right, no, we'll give you the approval, we're okay with it. God says, we deserve death. And when we come and we say, hey, all right, you know, I don't feel like doing that. That, That's not really me. I don't don't, don't want to do that. But, you know, you can do what you want, and that's all right with me. Just don't bring it over here to me. He says, you're given approval. And he says, and those are the things that deserve death. All our sin deserves death. There's no sin in the Bible that did not put Jesus on a cross. There's no sin that he didn't die for. So as Christians seeking to submit to God's design, we cannot give a rubber stamp or give an approval to anything that is contrary to God's design, regardless of what it is, regardless of what culture says about it. Otherwise, we say, I determine what is right, and I determine what is good, and we fall into idolatry. So God said homosexuality is a sin. So guess what? It's a sin. We can't put a rubber stamp on it. God said that sex outside of your marriage with someone who you're not married to is a sin, so you can't put a rubber stamp on it. I don't care what happened in your marriage. God said if you're doing it, it's still wrong. If you're doing it and you're not married and you're just doing it, because you love that person, you want to be with them. God says it's still sin. God says that if you're stealing, that that's sin. God says that if you're judgmental, that that's sin. God says if you're pride and you're boastful, that that's sin. And he says you got to stop all of that and turn in repentance. Because that's the only way. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, Paul again, he, he talks about this and he says, God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal that the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. This is God telling us that if we're going to name his name, we've got to depart from iniquity, that there are two defining marks that God says, I know them, and they depart from iniquity. 
There is no such thing as a disciple of Jesus Christ who looks like the world. You see, because all of God's people have this mark on them, they depart from sin. All of God's people. We depart from sin. It's the mark of being a Christian. You see, repentance looks the same for all of us, regardless of what our sin is. For every single one of us, we, we come and we acknowledge Jesus and we say, Jesus, I turn to you. I turn my life over to you and I'm sorry that I've put my desires above yours and I'm sorry that I place my desire above your design, that I've tried to be you instead of turning to you. Help me to live for you. That is what repentance looks like for all of us regardless of what our sin is. And salvation looks the same for all of us being washed by Jesus and being given the power to wrestle with our corruptions. The good news for you is that Jesus Christ came to save sinners and it doesn't matter what kind of sinner you are, it matters what kind of savior he is. And you and I can't fathom how wicked it is to stand and say to God, you will not be in charge, I'll be in charge. You don't determine what's good, I determine what's good. I don't care what your design is, this is my desire. We don't understand how wicked that is. In Romans chapter 3, Paul comes and he starts talking in, in verse 10 and he says, he says, there was no one righteous, not even one. None of us in this room are righteous. I don't care if you're a Christian, you are not righteous and you never will be unless Jesus Christ is in your life and that's still not your righteousness is his. In verse 11 he says, there is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. None of us sought God. All of us pursued sin. All of us pursued a life without him. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. We didn't go looking for him, he came looking for us. Verse 12 says that all have turned away and they together have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one of us. Not a single one of us in this room does good. But that's why Paul says in verse 23, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I want you to see that. For all have sinned, meaning past tense, and currently we all fall short of God's glory. Every single one of us. We all need salvation. We all need Jesus. You see, the greatest truth of the book of Romans is this, is that the righteousness of God is not just the standard by which God judges us, but the fact that the righteousness of God is a gift given through Jesus to those who recognize that they have no righteousness of their own and that Jesus earned it in our place. That's what Romans is all about, the entire book. Because we have all rebelled against God. But Jesus died for all of us. And the gospel says that the power of God has the power to heal us of sin. That the power of God has the power to cleanse us of corruption. And that he didn't come he didn't come to reward the righteous. He came to save the sinner. And that all who call on the name of the Lord can be saved. And this is Paul's message to us. See, I don't know why you're here this morning and I don't know what your sin is, but the reality is, is that we've all been affected by the fall. Every single one of us. And I'm not going to stand here and determine this morning who deserves salvation because none of us deserve it. But the reality is that that's the gospel message. That we had no hope, but Jesus became hope for us. And this morning, he wants to give that hope to you because there's none righteous, not one. But reality is only one, him. And no matter how hard you try, you will never earn it. And no matter how hard you work, 
you'll never get enough to be able to earn it. But God says, I have a gift that I give freely to you. And that gift is the gift of salvation. It's the gift of righteousness. It's the gift of cleansing. It's the gift of holiness. It's the gift of God that does not condemn us to hell, but that gives us eternal life. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I know this was a tough message. And I know that there are many of us here today who have heard this. And Father, maybe we're even wrestling right now with what we've heard. But Lord, I thank you that you are good. And that you love us and that your word is good. And the reason you sent your word was to heal our disease, was to heal our corruption, was to heal us from our sin and our brokenness. But just as we talked about last week, that we were the man on the side of the road, broken and bleeding and left for dead. We were half dead, but, but Jesus, the good Samaritan, came and saved us and cleaned us up. And today, God, I pray that we would receive this message humbly and realize that all of us like sheep have gone astray but that you will leave the 99 for the one that you will come for all of us God because you love us and even though we've made choices willfully that separate us from you that even though we have deceived ourselves into thinking that we don't know because we don't want to know you still come full of grace and truth. You still come full of love and mercy to fill our lives. And Lord, I pray today in Jesus' name that today would be a day where we receive that, that we recognize what you want to do in our lives, that you want to wash us, that you want to cleanse us, and that that's your free gift to us that costs us nothing but costs you everything. I want to ask this morning with all heads bowed and all eyes closed. You're here this morning. You've heard this message. You know we're all in the same boat. And that we all need Jesus. And if that's you this morning, you're saying, you know what? I need him today. I need him. I need him now because I've, I've gone astray. I've been rebellious. I, I've done, I've placed my desires above his design. Thanks for watching today's message. We pray that this message has touched your life. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus was God's son who came to give us that eternal life. It says that if we confess our sins that he is faithful to forgive us of them. Jesus came so that we could have an amazing relationship with God and our sins could be forgiven. If today you say, I want to live for God and be restored to relationship with Him, then pray with me. God, I surrender my life to you today. I repent of my sins and ask you to wash me and clean me. Empower me to live by your Holy Spirit as I follow you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me today, then we'd love to connect with you about this relationship that you have with God through Jesus. You can contact us at 345-949-2539 or through our website at www.agapekman.ky as we'd love to connect with you and help you on this new journey. God bless you.